One or two, uh, one or two comments just to round off our previous session. Something I didn't say before. There are many systems in the world now which are electronic reporting systems. Um, for example, Kenya, as you probably know, launched last month uh, internet reporting where anyone with internet access can report uh, anywhere in the country. A um, remarkable achievement for... And the same in Saudi, is that right? Very good. I mean, there are those opportunities. I've just been told about the, the system in Spain, which has a user... Um, and I hope we might be able to look at that. Um, a user-friendly internet form for patients and healthcare professionals. And a healthcare professional creates their own profile on that, so they never have to fill in all the extra details every time. It's only the only the details of the of, of the, the new case and so on. Um, so th there are there are very interesting and important developments taking place. And I think the other point is that we need to try and have a variety of reporting methods, don't we? You know, if we think about target uh, audience segmentation, different healthcare professionals will have different preferences. Some people will love using smartphones and will take the opportunity of doing it. Some will be happy with paper forms maybe sometimes. And of course paper forms can be accessible on the web for, uh, for downloading and printing if that's what somebody wanted. So that I think we need to be thinking about this, this kind of uh, collection of different ways of stimulating people's interest and engaging them. Um, and I think one of my, re my, my obsession and hysteria about paper forms is that for so, often, for so long they've been the only mechanism and, and, and in many ways a rather una unattractive and ineffective mechanism. Um, but good things are happening around the world and uh, we, we, uh, if, we can have, if we find the time, I think we must really try and find some way of sharing those so that we can see what people have achieved because uh, it, the picture is not all doom and gloom, but um, there, is, there is still a lot, to be, a lot to be done. Okay, thank you very much for getting back on time. This session we've got three quite distinct topics. Uh, and they're about, but they're related by the issue of how do we influence people to do things or take notice of what we think is important. And the three topics are the first is talking about safety information for health professionals, and a really quite short session on that, but focusing our attention on how can we make sure that health professionals have, um, have the kind of information, uh, safety in information they need and we, we, we have to give them. The second, thing, second session will be on the skills of negotiation and influencing. How do you make a willing audience? How do you get to the point of agreement to do something that both of you want? And the last section on this rather important topic for us called social marketing. So quite a lot to get through as usual. Um, and uh, I hope that... Uh, you will find this productive and useful for you as well. So the, the first question is to do with how do we get the best possible information about safety of medicines to the people who are prescribing and dispensing? Uh, and what can we ourselves do to improve that, the impact of that information? You know that it's one of the things that there is a lot of evidence um, that uh, much of the safety information put out by manufacturers and regulators has no effect on prescribing at all. Uh, and it's really very worrying. Uh, one of the great um, examples of that some for, from some years ago into which a lot of um, research was done was the contraindicated prescribing of cisapride in the United States, which was a very serious problem with uh, patients suffering quite considerably from the interactions of other drugs uh, when cisapride was, uh, was prescribed. And the FDA went through several communications campaigns to try and influence prescribing practice. And they did before and after measurement of uh, the number of cisapride prescriptions and the amount of being sold and so on. And uh, after a campaign of two years with all kinds of different things, prescribing practices had hardly changed at all. And it was one of the great lessons of the complexity and the challenge of influencing prescribing and dispensing practice. So the first question is, what methods do we have available? So in terms of getting uh, up-to-date safety information to 
uh, to healthcare professionals? What methods do we have available? And I've lost track of the microphone. Elke, do you have the microphone? Thank you very much. So, can you can you help us with this? Is that yes, all right? Yes, yes, of course. Okay. Yes. So, what are, what are the methods we have available? Starting with what you think are the most effective. The most effective. I was going to say packaging, so but it's not the most effective. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, there but package insert, okay, yes. that's, I mean, that's one. Yes. Um, there are also uh, many web-based drug information that you can get, which are quite accessible for everybody and very updated. Okay, so there is a lot of information available, uh, and on the internet is one very real place. Package inserts, yes, I think we have mixed feelings about. <laughs> uh, I think uh, most of the doctors can't have the time to access to the website and searching for the internet. Uh, in my country, uh, especially the gynecologists, doctors, they told that they work from nine till nine, you know? So in my country, most of these, uh, these informations are supplied by the medical reps of the drug companies, which is very helpful for the new information about the drugs. And that, that is not an entirely reliable source of safety information? Not entirely reliable? Yes, but most of them have no time to nope. get to the net. I take net the point, absolutely. Yes. No, you're right. And that's, this identifies the critical problem, is of how do you, how do you manage to find time in, yeah. b in the life of busy. What, are, what other ways do we use? Yes. Having established drug information services at hospital levels. Very good. And just tell us about the, the, the mechanism for that. How, does it w how would that work? Hospital um, drug information services, local hospital drug information yeah, services. Yeah, they can say, uh, you know, uh, you have queries. If you have queries, uh, there are papers in every hospital or in the every departments. And then if they have queries, they send it to the drug information and the drug information collect uh, all the reliable information and then they give to them uh, at their uh, earliest convenience. Okay. That's a little bit time consuming. Yes. Takes some time. Yes. yes. Okay. But it's a, it's a local focused um, service for local people which they will know about and which they would be maybe more encouraged to use than a national mm -hmm. service, for example. Yes. At the our office, we use um, a dear healthcare professional letter. Yes. So when there's a need to circulate safety information, we quickly draft, and then I think it goes faster, and it's it's in a simplified form such that they're able to capture all the salient points and makes it. Uh, we make it very easy for them to read and understand as well. How many pages is it? Just a page. One page. Yes. A four. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm sure. It have, can I just ask you about dear healthcare professional letters sent from manufacturers? Have you seen some of those? We do. We received we received some. I think in the early part of this year we did, and then we look at it, and then the um, messages that we have to put across to the health professionals, we just take from them, and then we send out. Anyone else got any comments about the manufacturers' dear healthcare professional uh, letters, which are still a very common way of um, of uh, Circulating new safety information. Um, when I saw, when I see all these uh, dear doctor letters of the manufacturers, it's like three or four uh, pages, yeah. and they hide the safety information yes. inside. Yes. So one of the first thing I did when I came, when I got to the job, um, I'm the head of the pharmacovigilance unit. I told all, <laughs> uh, all my units, that, uh, all the, all my team that I'm not going to accept this anymore. And I want uh, all the dear doctor letters to be one page, Good. Um, all the safety information on top, <laughs> and practical uh, information about what to do with the safety information. So. <laughs> Very good. Now there is somebody who's really trying to change things. Uh, in India, we brought out national formulary of India. 
which is the book for uh, rational prescribing medicines for healthcare professionals. So we provided all enough national formulary of India to all healthcare professionals to for ready reference to update the information about the safety and other uh, details of drugs. That's electronic or pe printed? Yeah, both, both. Both printed and electronic form up to date formulary. So in Spain, uh, uh, normally the therapeutic consultation is uh, it's a um, current job for uh, clinical residents and also for doctors in, in in this department. Almost all hospitals have uh, clinical pharmacology service, so this is uh, normal in our hospitals. And how is the how is the inquiry made? Well, um, sometimes by by phone, but normally by by um, electronic way. So okay. it, it comes from the hospital, from the emergency room, and also from a, con a external consultation yeah, as well. Good. Okay, very good. I mean, th that's yes. Okay, yes, sir. Actually, we have provide the healthcare professional by inf uh, with information by a list. So uh, we have uh, any healthcare professional can register <coughs> to our website and we can join to the A list and we send it the information, all the information uh, what we g release it and uh, and the press release. And other way we send our memo or circulate memo by fax by email to our coordinator in the hospital. So for them to d circulate. The yeah. information more. Yeah. Okay, two more then. Yes, did you? Someone over here? Was it no? Please. In Brazil, I think it's a problem, and there are a lot of doctors and healthcare professionals that get that information only at manufacturers information. Is the only way that they to get uh, information about new drugs, about safety issues, and they are there are a lot of uh, BS in this kind of information. Yeah, I think it's a problem in my hospital because they start to prescribing a lot of that that kind of drug mm -hmm. without anything to prove that it's really effective. Or what the risks are. Yes, or knowing what the risks are. Yes, one more. Okay, then we must. Oh, <laughs> <you're> <laughs> this is why I can't keep to time. Senora. Um, senora Isabel. Senorita. Senorita, <laughs> I'm very sorry. <laughs> um, the website from the National Regulatory Agency, for example, in Spain, is a good uh, source of um, the latest information. Um, that requires, yes, that requires going at, at the point, going to do it, yes. Yes, Francois, this is the last one for this, and we, mu we must move on, otherwise I should have the same time management problems I've had before. We have to, to back to the basic, I think, and uh, improve the, the education about pharmacology. I think uh, we have to, to improve the pharmacology, uh, pharmacology uh, education to improve uh, evidence-based prescribing. Okay, so that's that's a very radical proposal that doctors need to have a greater... Can I help you, ladies? Oh, I'm sorry. Because in Hong Kong, we actually, uh, when there's a safety issue, we want to make the healthcare professionals uh, to know. We actually send them letters by email or fax, but, but they uh, firstly, they have to register with us on the website first. Um, and we also send it to the professional association so that hopefully they will distribute the in information from there onwards. Okay, yeah. good. Thank you very much indeed. Now, I just want to ask you two questions. If you think about the most, whatever the be, might be the most effective, in an ideal world, what would be the qualities of the communication? What kind of things should we be thinking about in order to make these communications effective in terms of the method, uh, not so much the content, but what are, what are the kind of critical things to get information to healthcare professionals, to influence them as they're prescribing and dispensing. What, what would you say, with the, how would we judge an, a method as the most effective, what might be the most effective way? Uh, wait, please. By giving uh, regular periodical journals. Regular periodic? Journals. 
Journals. Journals. Okay, okay. No, I don't think that's the answer. I'm going to be very on Frank. Yes, go on. Two, two over there. Thank you. It's one way of doing it, but it's not going to be... I think the best way is to combining methods. Because there, there are people who like to receive an email, there are people who like to receive a letter, and to combine methods, for me, it's the best way to get the information available for everybody. Okay, so that's, a, that's talking about the market, uh, the audience is being varied and having different preferences for inf information. Yes, okay. Uh, I, I think the best method of, of providing the information is um, prescribing or dis dispensing program use the uh, clinical clinician or pharmacist is the best, <laughs> best way to, I, I think. Yes. I'm sure, yes, that, that I, I will come back to that because I think that's a very, very important point yeah. if we're looking for the ideal. Uh, in my country, we use uh, essential list and formula, national formula. Yes. Okay. And one more at the end from uh, Uri. I think uh, the opinion leaders uh, are very important in each country. It's universities and so on. Okay. Very. All right. One more, then we'll we'll, we'll move on. We'll move to to the big topic, which you you've just mentioned, I think. And to establish at every hospital the easy clinic uh, system. Uh, what? Is, just tell us what that is. If you need more elaboration, Garil Dawil knows more. I mean, just very briefly, what is this? Is it's just an electronic form of data collection. Okay, so okay, 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 okay. All right. So if, we thi if we're thinking about influencing people at the point of prescri prescribing or dispensing, you are right. What we need to have is an enforced mechanism so that the moment a doctor starts to think about prescribing a drug, on their, if they have a computer, then on their screen they get the safety information at the point they're thinking of, dis of possibility of prescribing. The same with pharmacists. Um, uh, when they're dispensing. So that instantly and immediately at the point of prescribing or dispensing, the, in, the, the critical information is available. That seems to me the only ideal way. Anything else is less than perfect. The next stage would be to have an absolutely up-to-date printed formulary. And I've been to doctors who said, I think I want to prescribe this, and they look it up in the book. And that's fine too. That's really pretty immediate and just there in, in front of them. Um, and maybe go on even to a website which gives you information about the drug. But do you see, as we go through that list of things, we're going through communications methods which are progressively less immediate and less convenient. And then if we start talking about <coughs> dear health care professional letters and journals and all these other things, you actually have to remember that you got a dear health care professional letter about this drug, or you have to remember the uh, you have to remember the content of it, and if it's a journal, well, I mean, that's even more elaborate uh, piece of research to do. So, and the other, the other one, I think, the point that you have made is that localized, immediate uh, access to good information, uh, and particularly um, uh, hospital pharmacists. I think pharmacists have a much greater part to play in pharmacovigilance and patient safety than they currently have. I think they should be, you know, th as a profession, they should be much more uh, assertive and evident because they, n they have a lot of the information which is needed. And they could also be the people who are doing some of the detailed reporting, of course. That's one of the other methods we didn't talk about. You know, a doctor says, I've got an ADR and hands it to the duty pharmacist who is expecting to do the rest of it. I mean, I think that, again, would be a, a mechanism of... Uh, increasing uh, people's willingness to report. But pharmacists, I think, uh, you know, pharmacies see more people than doctors uh, throughout the world. Far more people, far more patients. And I think we should be thinking about them constantly when we're thinking about reporting too. Um, but this, in terms of information, I think there is no question, is there, that w if we, can't, we maybe can't have immediate point of prescribing information, um, but we have to find some way of overcoming this question of volume. Now this is just, uh, this is a screen from a recent FDA. I get all FDA safety alerts. 
Uh, you probably all subscribe to this as well. And this is just the summary for the month. Um, March two th 2013 include the month 53 changes to warnings, indications, safety information, packaging and so on. 53 a month from this source alone. So in that sense, just sending out information about everything isn't enough, is it? I mean, you can't cope with it. You can't manage all that. And when we think about all the different kinds of um, uh, methods there are, I think we need to make a hierarchy of w the most effective to the least effective. And we need several. I mean, I think you're right, entirely right. We need to do it in lots of ways. But we need to think very much about, the. P I think, the point of prescribing and dispensing. How can we be sure that at that point, when the decision is being made and the risks discussed, the latest information is available? And some of these don't do that. Uh, dear healthcare letters don't. Uh, adverse drug reaction bulletins, yes, they're important to show summaries and to highlight important issues and so on. Email alerts, but these are all, by the time you've got a patient in front of you, these are all historic or filed, or in another room, or somewhere else, aren't they? I mean, th this, is the, this is the problem with all that stuff. Um, labeling changes and warning. Uh, detailing, this, this is rather a very interesting process, which you're probably aware of. Rather like uh, drug manufacturing reps, but these are pharmacist reps who go around talking to clinicians about the latest safety stuff, one-to-one. Uh, -one. Um, and in, I think it's in Australia now, there, there is a, 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 a detailing program funded by a local university or the government, I'm not quite sure, where um, for particular specialities, specialities, gynecology, rheumatology, whatever it is, individual experts will go around and talk to um, talk to physicians about the latest evidence and the latest safety stuff. Now that's labour intensive, very uh, quite expensive, and so on. But as soon as you move away from information for the individual, at the point of prescribing, every step you take away from that reduces the effectiveness of, of what you're doing. So the challenge for you, I think, is to find what are the systems which get closest, what gets closest to being in front of the, the prescriber or the dispenser at the point that the patient is about to have the, have the, have the drug. And we can't do it for everybody like as, as, as intimately as that. But that's the standard, isn't it? So is what we're doing close to that or is it a long way from that? And the, uh, many of the, th the conventional ways are a long way from that. And the other one, the personal one, is the pharmacist on duty uh, or the pharmacist around in a hospital. You know, the physician says, I really want to, I, you know, I want to, what's the latest on steroids? And bring, you know, so the pharmacist is there, can give you an answer, either a delayed answer or an immediate one. Um, so the challenge there is, I think, very clear, isn't it? And, and yes. OK. Telemedicine and helplines, he says. Yes, of course. And all these things are great, but they're still one step away, aren't they? They require a diversion to go somewhere else and to know where to go. Um, whereas the, uh, obviously, electronic prescribing and dispensing systems, you can't do it without having the information in front of you. I mean, that's the, uh, th that's the kind of beauty of that. But yes, we need all these methods, uh, and for different people, for different things. So we've talked about the most effective methods, uh, and this is, not everybody can have tablets and smartphones, I understand that, but that's the image, it seems to me, of the the best safety information communication is that the minute he's talking to a patient about a possible treatment, he's got it um, there instantly. Um, now, what are you doing? Um, let's leave that for now. Um, we have to assess the effectiveness of communications. We've talked a lot about that. And these are some of the ways in which once we have our systems, we've decided what we're going to do, we can begin to assess whether or not we're having any effect. And of course, you need to do before and after assessments, like uh, I said with the, the Cisapride, the famous Cisapride one. Um, 
how many prescriptions for this drug, uh, how many ADRs before our communications and our campaigns, what are the trends afterwards. Um, and of course, uh, if possible, look at the sales figures for individual drugs in a country as well. That's a very important and useful denominator when we're looking at, at safety. Are there other ways you can assess the effectiveness of communication in prescribing safety? I mean, particularly in s new safety information. Because we send out all this stuff, healthcare professional letters, bulletins, journals, uh, emails, all the rest of it. Does it have any effect? How do we know? Do any of you do any of you n know what effect these have? Not really. So that's something we need to think about, isn't it? And how do we find out? Well, these ways. What are other ways? What's the other the other obvious way of finding out if your communication is having any effect? I'm not asking you anything difficult. I just want to make sure your brain's working in the right direction. Yes. Probably the num Probably the number of ADRs that are appearing after the prescribing. Mm, okay, that w that's counting, yes, that's certainly one way of doing it, yes. You can't uh, take that as a figure because you don't, because if the number of ADRs are increasing because they were under-reported. Yes, so yes. Th there are uh, confounding factors in counting ADRs, always, yeah. aren't they? Yes, that's right. Yes. I think by drug utilization. Okay, though these are these are technical quantitative ones. I'm really thinking of the qualitative one of asking physicians uh, what <laughs> whether they feel the communications they're receiving are influencing their practice. I mean, that's the first thing, isn't it? To say to pharmacists and physicians, you know, we've been sending you these emails for a year. Do they have any effect? Do you remember them? Can we do it differently? Does it influence your prescribing? Ask it to the to the persons who receive those letters. Ask yes. if they read them and ask. Yes. <laughs> this is the way. Maybe. Yes. Because I think I think you are absolutely right. I mean, the standard manufacturer's healthcare professional letter of four pages. Most people won't read. Most most doctors have in trays this high. Journals, memos, instructions, budgets, forms. I mean, truly, uh, unless we actually manage to get something absolutely into their visual field and into their attention at the point it's urgently needed. It's very good chance it will just stay in the stack of rubbish. So these are the issues we've been talking about and I um, I think it's very, I think it's now, I hope it's clear to you that the, g the gold standard is this information at the point of prescribing for the individual person and then we have to try and make sure that we push whatever method we're doing to take it as close to that. And this was going back to the priorities issue. Do you remember this morning I talked about the, uh, having a simple message about ADR reporting? And these are just two other examples which are part of the context of reporting, um, which I quite like. And I'm not suggesting you adopt these, but they are just, it, for example, if this is um, uh, an uh, NH trust in, NHS trust in the UK, and they have institutionally these priorities. And it seems to me, here, here is our priority too, as it happens, you know, and that's the number one of three priorities. And if that's a, a, a widely um, communicated message, constantly reinforced, you know, our priority is patient safety, reduce adverse events, we do no harm. That's a kind of wonderfully clear message. And this is a different example from a completely different part of uh, healthcare, which is not specifically relevant to us, but it's an example from the World Alliance for Patient Safety of what they call the high fives in standing operating procedures uh, for patient safety. Uh, and again, it's, it, it shows a focus, a clarity about what the priorities are. And I think that's one of the things that will help us uh, make our presence more, more stronger uh, by clearly identifying what we do with a very high level um, uh, objective. So, what are we going to do to help this pharmacist make sure her patients don't die? Well, there we are. We've now got some ideas. Any thoughts about that? So that's the end of part one, is really looking at this 
um, safety information for healthcare professionals. Any thoughts, in inspirations? Are you doing anything in your country which is um, wonderful and effective and saving lives? I'm sure you are, so but I'm not being cynical about this. But <laughs> uh, maybe I would say that in my in my hospital, uh, trying to build bridges uh, among the specialties to share uh, um, what what is the latest uh, information about safety. That would be. Uh, get everyone with, with the latest information on, on safety issues. Uh, across specialities? Across the specialties in the right. hospital, because they, they normally used to work uh, isolated. I don't know why. You know, everyone is uh, the, ki the king in, in its yes. kingdom. So. And is that, is that kind of process of collaborative discussion influencing the safety profile of the hospital as a whole? I think so. And uh, you know, presumably you're going to do, do some research and to, for evidence of that, but there is a feeling that people are beginning to behave in, in ways which follow these priorities of safety more, more clearly. Yeah, good. Uh, yes. I had an electric bulb while you were <laughs> talking Oh, about she had an electric bulb. Yes. Good, good, good. Wonderful. Yes. Because uh, we were thinking in Croatia, because we are uh, using the electronic medical records for the doctors. And uh, so when we send the healthcare professional letter, we can't be sure that they have received it, read it via paper form and so on. So we were thinking that wha when they open the computer in the morning to healthcare care professional to arrive on their screen and that they just press, okay, I've seen it, so that we have kind of a confirmation that it has been read. But now when I'm listening, I think there is even a better moment at the time of prescription of medication to this information to pop up. So I think this is an even more efficient way. So maybe I will discuss it with my colleagues back home. That's very interesting, isn't that? But that's the, the, the what she just described of making sure the letter arrives on the uh, desktop of a healthcare professional in the morning, and they have to um, they have to press a button to acknowledge that they've seen it. Um, and clearly, that that is in principle is a great idea, isn't it? Although, of course, cynical physicians will just press the button and get on with the day without reading it, but at least you do have some confirmation that it arrived. I mean, that, that in itself is, is good, isn't it? Because otherwise you may not, may not know at all. But the notion of having the healthcare professional letter information coming up as they prescribe, as long as it's very... Sh I mean, it's, yes, it's not the original letter, I think, is the important thing. I'm sorry. So I'm not a healthcare professional in that sense, but what um, we are trying to do in Ghana is to introduce electronic medical record yes. systems in various hospitals and clinics to get doctors to use data in real time. And so um, we've made effort and some people have started using it and they've, se they've seen good results. Because some of these systems, they flag contraindications and they pop up, sa a safety message will pop up. Let's say you are prescribing a drug to a pregnant patient that shouldn't be taking that drug and information will pop up to say that you shouldn't be prescribing this drug to a pregnant patient. So um, that's something that we also do. Very good. Okay. Good. I th all right. One more from Brazil. Thank you. I'd like to say that I use electronic uh, uh, dev uh, devices and the problem is the excess of pop-ups. We have to do this day after day because the electronic information does not come uh, take a conversation with the patient uh, history and al always pop up, pop up, pop up. We start to close it without reading. Yes, 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 yes. That's a very important observation again, isn't it? We have to understand what human behavior is like. Unless the information you're getting what by whatever means, paper or screen or uh, telef uh, mobile phone or whatever it is, is perfectly relevant to the moment, the, your needs at that moment, then people may not pay any attention to it at all. So it, this is, it's this question of getting the stuff to people at the moment they feel they need it, isn't it? That, that's, the, that's the extraordinary challenge. 
Um, and you, and, and it, it can't be just a matter of coincidence. It may be that one healthcare professional in one year arrives on the day you're prescribing that drug. But it's very unlikely, isn't it, really? So this notion of accumulating information all the time and expecting people to be able to retrieve it or remember it and so on is a delusion because in terms of busy people's lives and human psychology it really doesn't work so you're, you're very you're absolutely right we have to again think about this standard how do you get the precise information at the exact moment it's f it's needed and there is a not just a willing audience but an audience wanting that information and uh, all the other stuff uh, may pr may um, uh, provide some service, some use in terms of building up a reference library. But on the whole, I don't think a lot, <laughs> you know, if you think of all that stuff. Okay, so the standard, can you try and remember this when you're thinking about systems? The standard is to get as close to the individual as you can, either electronically or personally. Personally with a pharmacist, personally with a... Uh, 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 an information counsellor about drugs, but the ideal, the great, the best communications are always when it feels as though it's one to one. And the further you get away from that in terms of mass communications or mass mailings and so on, the less effect you're likely to have always. So there's the, again, we can we can judge what we're doing against that that ideal and then see how far from it are we. And things like healthcare professional letters from manufacturers, generally speaking, very low down that hierarchy, I think. They're a kind of gesture rather than an effective uh, contact. Okay, let's leave that for now. I, I hope that uh, some, some provocative thinking for you. Um, what are the takeaway lessons? Well, we've done that, I think. Um, yes. Headline information, particularly through audience-driven channel, not through the things which are easy for us to send out from offices in, or uh, manufacturing facilities. And the motivation of people to take notice of it. And again, this thing that I think we, ne we should be looking to involve pharmacists much, much more actively and, and um, energetically in pharmacovigilance. Okay, my next part two. I want to talk to you about the skills of negotiation and influencing. So, why would I want to have a s want you to have a session on negotiating? No negotiation. You are not stockbrokers and bankers and businessmen after all. But why might it be useful for you? Any thoughts? Yes. Brazil is really on the ball this afternoon, <laughs> uh, this morning. Okay, let's uh, let's have I'm some competition. I'm full of oxygen. <laughs> let's have some competition from Asia. Uh, uh, the question for me is that I have to prove to my colleagues that it's important uh, between all the activities that they have to do during the day, and negotiating that with them about this. It's really important because we have to do meetings to prove then that it's important. And you can't just tell them, can you? You can't say, yes, you have to get there. You have to, they have to be willing. Yes. Because the first thing of uh, advocacy is negotiation. Good. And I, I think th this, this reason this is not a very long session is because I think most of this will be obvious to you. But I want, I want to take you through the steps so that you actually really see what, um, how, you, how, how to move through the stages of negotiation. Now, cust th this is a typical kind of diagram. You know win-win, win-lose. You know that, uh, all, th all that old stuff. Um, and one person wins and the other loses. That's, that's a common uh, uh, experience, of course. Um, I lose, you win. I win, you win. That's, that's the great one. This is my cynical view of bureaucratic official um, uh, official communications that uh, we send out lots of crap from the from the the, the headquarters in the capital city, um, and it has no effect. So we lose, and uh, the recipients lose because they don't get the benefit of the information we want to give them. I mean that's that's one way of looking at official communications which fail because they're not targeted then you know so everybody nobody gains anything 
And of course, what we want to try and do all the time is, you know, what we do, we succeed in, and other people we're involved in are winners as well. That, that what we do is uh, successful for everybody. And that is quite a complicated process. You just described it a little bit about persuading your colleagues to agree to uh, something that you are um, that you want to do, and they're agreeing to it. What is the thing that negotiation is not about? Or can you tell me what sometimes negotiation is talked of in ways that are not really negotiation? What can what what is it? What's the successful outcome of a negotiation? It's success, exactly, yes, but what precisely? Meeting of minds? Go on. Can you repeat the question? What, are the, what is the quality of a successful negotiation? What is a successful negotiation? Yes, uh, it is, uh, in the end, I say you are wrong, but say it in another way. No. no it's <laughs> 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 I don't think you are wrong, but no. you are wrong. No, that, that's manipulation, <laughs> which is quite different. Go on, next. Both parties win. Right? Uh, yes, and what do, we mean, what do we mean by that? Yes, you're right, of course, but what do we, what do we mean? By winning? Yes. Um, you gain something out of it, right? Both parties. Both, both of course. Okay. Otherwise, it's somebody is not happy, right? Yes. And then you're back to the... Yes, quite right. One or two more, then we'll stop. Oh, this <laughs> you've got lots of ideas about this. Okay. Yeah, I think um, negotiating will be finding a common ground where the both parties are comfortable and okay. be able to Good. meet their target yes. as well. Yes, yes, yes. Let's, let's just take that. You're right. I mean, it is to do with finding the common ground where both parties are happy with the outcome. And I want to show you um, yes, yes, solving a problem or achieving a goal through collaboration with others, it's collaborative, uh, who may see the problem differently or have different goals at the beginning or even still have different goals at the end, but are happy with the outcome. And this applies to every kind of relationship. As I've said, buyer and seller, provider and consumer, employee and manager, parent and child. This is what we do with our children to get them to do with what we want. We either tell them what to do, yes, okay, or, or we negotiate a solution about how many hours of television today in exchange for, you know, all this stuff. This is all the same. The same skills are actually needed. Patient and health professional, or health professional and so on. And PV centers and health professionals. This is the point that what we do is a negotiation with our audiences to to convert them to willing audiences. I'm taking up this point that you m mentioned and valued on Monday. So, I, I want to give you an example. I want to work through an example and just see how, uh, what, what, is the, what are the steps in a negotiation. And let's take the example of a hospital senior pharmacist buying, uh, procuring drugs from a pharmaceutical company, okay? The purchase of medicines from a pharma company. So, what are the objectives of the pharmacist in, uh, in going to her negotiation with the pharmaceutical company to buy a drug supply for her hospital? What's her primary objective? Go, say? Good quality drugs for cheap. Good. Very good. She is looking for good quality drugs cheaply. Oh, well, at the best price. Yes, not necessarily cheap. We need, yes, we need to be careful about that. And what's the pharmaceutical company looking for? Maximize profit. Yes, obviously this is all very obvious, isn't it? So the pharmacist wants the best quality, lowest price, and continuity of supply would be another thing, I suppose. Pharma company wants to sell medicines and maximize revenue and profit. What are the areas where there are already agreement before they start talking? Very good. One wants them, one wants to have them, and the other wants to sell them. Okay, yes, and I mean, th that's the principal thing. Um, the pharmacist wants, and the pharmaceutical wants to sell, and also this notion of preferred supply. That's, a, that's right. 